I, there's no spiel today because I talked so much on, on September 6th and I talked a lot on, on September 7th, but I just want to pick up a strain that I developed uh, and I've been thinking about this. Uh, I don't think it is uh, remiss to uh, compare or to think of Gotthard Ephraim Lessing and Martin Balzer really in one breath. They were born 200 years apart, uh, uh, Lessing in 1729 and Balzer in 1927, so they share <laughs> the letters of, of their verse, but they were, they are both they were both public intellectuals. You could think of Gotthard Ephraim Lessing as the one who was writing positively. If you think about differences right away, positively about a Polish Jew, and you could think that the first thing that will come to mind, certainly when you mention the name Martin Balzer, is someone who wrote satirically about the most prominent uh, Polish Jew who was there. And whether this was done positively or negatively, uh, we will have to that will emerge as we are reading these texts. Both Lessing and Vaza were public intellectuals. Lessing was the first. Oh, I have no headset. Oh, well, does it matter? Oh, okay, I should use that. Oh, gosh. No, you don't need it. So where is it? But you don't need it today. Susanna. Nothing was lost, You don't need it because we have this mic over here. No, you don't I need like it. I like this mic because I like to walk close up. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, the surround yeah. mic is fine? Yeah. Oh, it, it reports beautifully? Yeah. I don't need this? No. Whoa! Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so... Are you with us? I was giving you a chance to get adjusted. You were giving me what? Giving you a chance to get adjusted. Ah, okay. Can you, can you move up a little bit? No, I'm, I'm you, hot. I have to cool off. I'm just... Ah, okay. Very good. All right, so... So, to you, the first lesson, the first... Uh, German public intellectual, fiercely independent, did not want to be employed, Martin Walser, exactly the same. Uh, one of his uh, career moves would have been to work for uh, public radio to Deutsche Rundfunk, and he was offered a contract, and he didn't want it because he never wanted to be employed. So he was very, very keen on being completely independent, not being part of an institution, wanting to be a writer, wanting to live by making money by his pen, and therefore experience, like Lessing, constantly financial insecurities, which of course you saw uh, flow, into, flow into his work. Both of them were gamblers. Both of them loved to gamble. Uh, lost big time at the Wanna Roulette, and I don't know actually what, uh, what Lessing was playing. Pharaoh he was playing. Pharaoh. Far, uh, and so two gamblers, two public intellectuals, uh, writing about Jews, one with a reputation writing very positively, one with a reputation writing very negatively, and in between those 200 years, we have all of German Jewish history. Lessing writes at the very beginning, Vaza writes at the very end. So to some degree, you have bookends here. If you could think in, the, uh, in terms of Lessing and Walser, what would come to mind, I'm not sure how much you know about Lessing, what would come to mind as I would think the two most important differences. Just sort of growing. Uh, Lessing very much preoccupied with religion, Balza absolutely not. Lessing part being, uh, being the son of a Protestant pastor who was very orthodox, had a fight with Protestantism, Orthodox Protestantism all his life, was very deeply involved, very radically involved in the theological discussions of the time. Those all have run their course by the time Vals, of course, runs around. There's no more theological discussion. What you could think about at that time, we're really talking about the late 1970s now, we're looking at these two novels, would be they were fierce politi political discussions. And it's surprising, actually. I was looking up 1977, all the things you certainly were, I'm not sure if you were in Germany at the time, but 1977, boom, what you think is Ponto Hubert Schleier, the Rote Armee Fraktion. It was one of the most radical times, one of the most disturbing times in Germany. And you look at these novels, it's really not there. Yet at the same time, both Lessing and Walser were fierce polemicists. Both of them wrote dramas. Lessing, of course, didn't write any novels. The major difference, I would think, is Lessing cannot be nailed down to a geographic region, and Walser can. If you think about Lessing, 
what makes him into a German writer is not that he was beheimatet or rooted in a particular region. He was moving around quite a bit. His heimat, his rootedness is in the German language. That is also true for Walzer, but in a very different way. Because with Walzer, you also get the integration of dialects and regional versions, the regional varieties of German into, into, uh, into German prose. At the same time, he writes stand, standard prose, so he locks himself into a tradition of German writing that is in Hochdeutsch. At the same time, I will, I, if we have time to read it, I brought a poem that he wrote in Alemannisch, and you will see that this language is completely different. So there is actually, there's actually diglossia, there is a dual language system. Yes, glad to interrupt, but this touches on something important. I read these two books in English, and there's no attempt to distinguish the dialects. There's constant ah. reference, there's constant reference to the Swabian dialect or whatever, or, you know, and obviously it means something because it reflects on the characters as characters, mm -hmm. but there's no attempt to, to reproduce a different It dialect. is very difficult indeed. You have, if you think about, if you think about uh, Swanvilla right now, Schwanenhaus right now, you have three regional dialects integrated into that book that are very prominent. And the three dialects, if you, you need to think now because Walzer is deeply rooted in a particular area, so south of Germany, it is between Lake Constance, Bodensee, and the Danube. And you have, if you think about this area south of the Danube going down to Bodensee, you are actually arriving at an area where three countries meet, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. They're both above this lake at the very tip of the lake, the very uh, easternmost tip of the lake. And at the same time, so you have regional variations there too. You hear Swiss German all the time, you hear Austrian German all the time. And the three dialect, uh, dialectal variants of German that are spoken are Swabian. So that would be nor to the north of this area that I just talked about, the area around Stuttgart and south. You have uh, the Alemannian dialect, Alemannisch. And you have Bavarian, because in Linda, which is about uh, 40, kilom uh, 40 um, train minutes south of Überlingen, where Walser lives, you already are in Bavaria. And you have a character, a very important character in Schwanenhaus, who speaks Bavarian and marks himself thereby as an Auslander. He says, when you are in Ausland, when you are in, in foreign territory, you really ought to speak Bavarian, and that is Stöckel. The Im oh, yes. Stöckel, the Im Max Stöckel, oh, yeah, the yeah. impregnator of Phil Rosa, Phil is an Icelander. Uh, he is someone who comes from a different, from a different um, area. area. And it's actually the Ausland because it is uh, because actually you did need at some point a passport to go in, into Bavaria. So you actually have three variants of German integrated into this novel and very elegantly integrated in this novel, which is written in Hochdeutsch, which is a fourth variant of German. I was wondering how that would be done in English. I did not look at English translation. So you just have standard standardized English? Very standard with, with reference to, to the fact that this was a person from so-and-so who spoke in that accent. But what I wanted to ask you is, if you do that in English, in English, not American, when you're on stage in the drama, you can, you can pinpoint a person's intelligence, background, breeding, by, by using different dialects, by diff using different regional accents, less so in this country. Does it flow over into German? I mean, are, they, are these meant to be rustic dopes, for instance, or are they meant to be city slippers, or are they meant to be just you know, slow people, or just slow people from the, from the north country? Let me, uh, let me preface this by asking how many people here in this room are native speakers of German? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we got eight. So we got eight people who could answer this. My first bit, and you can gainsay that or, 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 or contradict that, uh, is that it is not stratified by class or by education if you speak a regional dialect. But that, I think, is specific to the South because the South has the reputation of having very educated and very independent people who can afford, just by virtue of being extraordinarily self-confident, having their own history, having had their own aristocratic history, certainly the parents had the, the Wittelsbacher, and having had this extraordinary self-confidence, their pride in their region, 
combined with high standard of education, are very they are okay speaking their speaking their dialect. But and it's even, going away now. But it is going away. This is going. I'm speaking now about the 1970s, where in fact this re-ethnicization was just as it was here, just becoming the vote. So it's not associated with that. And even I think if you're in Parliament, you cannot speak. You cannot if you go to, in, if you're in Parliament, you're a member of Parliament. You cannot speak Bundestag or Bundesrat. You cannot speak in your dialect. But it is okay to have a slight inflection of your regional dialect, which can, in fact, work to your advantage. <coughs> Schäuble, for instance, what is he now, defense yeah. minister? Finance. Uh, well, he, he, he rules through everything. He's some minister of some kind. He was finance, and he was in and he was all sorts of things. Uh, is a man of the South, from Stuttgart. And when he talks, you will associate the Swabian dialect was extremely hardworking and economically hard-nosed. You would associate the dialect spoken in Cologne with actually quite a different kind of mentality. So you have mentalities associated with it, but not levels of class and not levels of education. Uh, the native speakers here, am I in the ballpark? Do you have other experiences with other varieties of German? Maybe you're from north or east or west or? Well, I'm not a native speaker, but that's my experience in Vienna, for instance, that educated people often speak. Dialect. Yeah, in Vienna yeah, it's quite different because there's a national pride also associated with it. Yeah. But people would have to be, it would be expected that you would have to be bilingual. You yes. speak the you speak the standard variety and you speak your little variety. <coughs> I would merely add to that that in Viennese, as in the other dialects, I assume, there are levels yes. of dialect. Yes, there, that is true. Influence or selection. Yes, that is true. So at, the, at the top level, usually if you're very educated, you are probably well to do, secure. And you can speak uh, uh, Viennese with a strong dialect influence. Whereas if you go all the way down the ladder, um, we find this in all sorts of comedies, for example, Viennese comedies. That is where true. the uneducated speak what is in, in Viennese German or in standard German called ein gemeines Deutsch. It's uneducated, it's uninformed, and it is simply very unattractive. And what it also reflects, actually, is the difference between an urban form of dialect, the Munich Bavarian, and the, the Hintermark Bavarian. So there is a difference. And of course, once you have the regional variety that is spoken in the countryside, it gets associated with standards of education. So I think that's kind of like straightforward. OK, let's talk about the books. Regina, oh, last comment, and then we go okay. to. OK, you might have something similar in the American South. How so? I'm not well, I mean, I suppose class distinctions, but still speaking with a strong regional Right, you, regional can speak, you can speak with a certain regional inflection, meaning that you are from the plantation variety, and you can speak carpetbag or su southern yeah, English, yeah. which of course is not very attractive. So yeah. I do think that it, that is actually comparable. Okay, now we have two books today. One of them uh, written in just about two weeks, that's Fleet of Fiat, Runaway Horse. Uh, he wrote in August 1977, in just about two weeks, he was at work at an, on another novel at that time. Uh, he had just published in 1976, Jenseits der Liebe, which of course uh, occasioned the review that really was the uh, most famous, or I'm sorry, I should say most infamous rotten review ever written, which is Reich von Master, Reich von Nitzke's one page review of Jenseits der Liebe in 1976, that this one novel was not worth worth reading, not one chapter of it, not one sentence of it, not one word, word of it. And two years later, uh, this was Reichelnitzky, we'll, we'll have to look at this review again. Two years later, he published um, Ein Fliehendes Pferd, and Reichelnitzky published a review that it was the best book written in Germany in a very long time. The review was, uh, was headlined Ein Glanzstück, a brilliant, piece, a brilliant piece of writing. And in fact, critics agreed that with this book, there was a real turn real reorientation of Walzer's style of writing. The sentences got shorter, uh, the, uh, there was more focus on action, there was less personnel, it was less 
uh, narcissistic, less self-reflective, and at that point, of course, you always have critics worry about the uh, well-being and the intellectual level of their writers. Now, Balzac was criticized of pandering to the masses. Now, this was criticized as being borderline uh, entertainment. He is moving from literature to Unterhaltung. These are the kinds of things that Germans worry about at the time. And I think that this move from, from being an extraordinarily self-reflective uh, writer with very, very long uh, phrases, long sentences, complicated syntax, to a writer with very short sentences and with a gripping uh, plot uh, was extraordinarily disorienting uh, to critics at the time. And then this followed, there was another novel in between, actually a couple of novels in between, and it was followed by the Schwanhaus. These two books uh, represent really the zenith of, uh, of Walz's career, so 1978 and, nine, and 1980, when he was really at his absolutely most popular. And these are still the two books that are written and they've become classics and they're written in schools now all the time. So this is my opening bit. Now, uh, as you know, my usual thing is to invite your comments and we will read your opening comments, your, your first impressions, your reading difficulties, issues, and then we will weave out of that an, an interpretation of the two novels. So I just want to see where you are in your reading and what you and what you make of it. Okay, Pat. Oh, I'll start. You didn't with want to move ahead and move. Come. I'm move still cooling off. I have oh. a more to get. Um, I don't if only if no one else wants to start. Uh, my reaction to these books was that you're being kept constantly off balance in your relationship to the narrator. And you were constantly kept off balance in your relationship to what? The narrator. To the narrator. Yes. Mm -hmm. you're, it is never clear. You have to make up your own mind as you go. I mean, it's clearly artifice. But you know, are these people, are they off their rockers? Are they good family people? Are they sort of introverts? Where do they stand on the scale of, you know, being decent people? It's never clear, actually. You have to make up your mind. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, uh, certainly uh, as to... Um, well, the f hey, in the first book, in Runaway Horse, he tries to kill his old schoolmate. I mean, is there, is there any doubt in anyone's mind that he, he kicks the tiller out of his hand? And he has to live with this you know, monster monster thing in his, in his mind, in his brain. Mm -hmm. And in the second book, what, what are we meant to make of in, uh, in Swanville? What are we meant to make of this business about him crawling around on the carpet? Or his sexual uh, thoughts and his complete disassociation from his daughter who's in the hospital? I mean, it's, it's, it's very odd and I think deliberately so. And you come to the end of the book and you think, well, that was an oddity. I don't well, know what to say, but I'd like to hear your, your answers to some of those wow, questions. You want, wow, you might have well, okay, we have, we have an hour for, for the answer, and I hope you will help me. Okay, that is an opening big. So you don't know if these are good guys or bad guys, and you care about them. You want to know where the narrator stands and if they are decent people. Are they okay. sharing the music? Um, or maybe the check one. It's Marcel Reich Ronitsky. That's right. Marcel Reich Ronitsky, then we 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 can talk we can talk over. Okay, I think what we'll have to do, we're gonna take them one at a time. Okay? So let's start with one away course because it's much easier <coughs> to grasp. It's very uh, those of you who have been here both for for Goethe and for Kafka will have had a, 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 a feast because there are, of course, plenty of illusions. Of course, it is clear there are two couples, and if you think about elective affinities, we have pretty much the same constellation. Uh, two couples, and there is an attractive and elective affinity between the two couples, and there is an exchange of partners, sort of imagine. This is at least what happens. And in fact, we have a a clarification of this allusion to elective affinities, certainly in this, because the dog's name is Otto. And you remember that the two male characters in, uh, in, in elective affinities are both called Otto, although one of them wants to call himself Eduard because he doesn't want to be called Otto in order not to be confused. Okay, so we have that. But that's really all there is in terms of an elusiveness. But it's very important for Walzer, as you will see, he is he is an entertaining writer at the same time as a writer's writer. He very consciously 
wants to put himself into a literary tradition. Günter Grass has claimed Fonti, has claimed Fontana, and has claimed the Northern writers, and he is claiming a very different kind of tradition that he wants to link himself into. You remember perhaps that I asked in our, uh, in, in, the, in the opening bit that I gave last week, uh, challenged you to think about, is Kafka a German writer? There cannot be any doubt in anyone's mind that the opening pages in Schwanenhaus, in Swan Villa, are a take on the metamorphosis. And when you're talking about the creepy crawling, okay, uh, which is at the end, the opening page, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not doing this right now, but the opening page of, uh, of Schwanenhaus is a very clear allusion to the metamorphosis of the great Samsa, as is the person who is the sales representative. The sales representative as a figure, and in fact as a representative of the writer who has to sell something in the marketplace that no one wants, is a very important figure, both for Kafka and for Martin Galza. Does because he can't get out of bed? Or is, is, there something, is there something more than just the fact that he can't get out of bed? What makes you say that it's the metamorphosis? But, but it's absolutely clear. Well, would you kindly tell <laughs> Okay, good. The arms are very nicht auf the. Okay, plötzlich saß er auf dem Bettrand. You, did you read the Metamorphosis just recently? Sure. Okay, good. It plötzlich saß er auf dem Bettrand. Exactly the way. I'm, I'm sorry, you don't speak German. But suddenly he sat on, on the on the uh, on the edge on the edge of the on the edge of the bed. His feet very deep down on the floor. You remember as Gregor Sansa wants to get out of bed and he's walking himself back and forth and he sits on the edge of the bed and he's trying to get his, his feet down. The arms er werde nicht mehr aufstehen is precisely the fear that the that the beetle that that the cushion shop is actually it's a, a cockroach that he fears. He gefahr ausgefahren für einen weiteren Tag could be taken straight out of the opening page of the metamorphosis. This fear that you will that you will fail, the fear that you will fail your family, the fear that you will never be functional, the fear that you will that you are insufficient, the fear that you will be regarded poorly is precisely the fear of from which Lego Samsa is suffering. And then later you have all the illusions to the family, to the sister, uh, the, the fear that you cannot provide, the fear to fail providing the, the fear that you will provide for your family. Absolutely. And you have, this is actually just as well constructed as this. Both of these novels have circular, one novella and one, one novel, have circular constructions. You know, you'll notice, of course, that the opening sentence of this novella is also the closing sentence. So that here comes part of your, an, a partial answer to your, to your question. What you have here is a statement of defense. Okay, at the very end it becomes clear this is very much a book about a marriage. It may be about many, many other things, but it is about, humanly speaking, what, and this is the, the major difference to all of Kafka, between Kafka and, and Walzer. In Walzer's novels, the protagonists are always married, and usually to strong, quiet women, to whom they have to relate. In Kafka's text, the protagonist is never married. The protagonist is always solitary. This book is a book about a marriage. Deep, deep down, it's a book about a marriage. It's also about failing. It's also about anxiety. It's also about being middle class. It's also about not being able to function in the capitalist system. But it is about how do you talk to your wife. And here comes your sexual stuff, OK? Um, Sexuality, as we learn through Buch, has been co-opted by the marketplace. It's like a competitive thing. How often do you do it with your wife? Is what some is what Klaus asks him. Okay? And he doesn't want to answer this because it's a private thing. And he doesn't want this relationship with his wife to be in any way competitive. Sabine and Anna are very similar characters. And it becomes very clear in Schwanenhaus that to have a functional relationship. There are two, two, things, two ways of talking. This is a book about writing, ultimately. The two ways of talking. One way is when you can talk to your wife and you reveal. Two, two, the two forms of narrative are you talk in order to conceal something. When he talks as a professional, he or he talks in public, 
He tries to conceal what he has to say. Feshbaiten is a very important word here. Not to be known, to, be, to appear other than you actually are, and to put words in front of you as a mask behind which you can disappear. That's talking in public. That's one form of writing. To, re to, to say something that sells something that is attractive without giving yourself away. And the other form of talking that is really the subject of this book, is really the subject of this book is when you are at home in bed, it's actually a very good novel I was thinking of in the English tradition, Ian McEwan's Saturday begins with a couple in the bed and ends with a couple in the bed. And it's just set on one Saturday. And it's about how you talk to your spouse. So you can only afford to have this double life that both of these narrators have, especially Sir and have, to be pretend you are one way in public and one way at home, when at home you are really rooted in the person you are married to. And a functional marriage, now we're actually really already deep down in the key, and we need to go back and do this much more carefully, is when you are able to do the opposite kind of talking that you do in public, not the talking of concealment, the talking of revealing yourself. And this book, you, see, you know, the, the last sentence is, das wäre die Lösung, schön sagte sie, und jetzt? Jetzt fange ich an, I'm at the second last paragraph, now I'm beginning. Es tut mir leid, sag er, I am sorry. Aber, aber es kann sein, ich erzähle dir alles von diesem Helmut, dieser Sabine. But it's possible, I will tell you everything about this Helmut talking, about this Helmut and about this Sabine. Nur zu, sagte, die, sagte, sagte sie, ich glaube nicht, dass ich dir alles glaube. Just go ahead, but I don't believe that I will believe everything. Das wäre die Lösung. That would be the solution, he says. Also bitte sagte er, es war so. And then he says the first sentence of here. And the whole thing, now coming back, since you already asked all the relevant questions, and now we're coming back to the kicking away of the, of the, of the rudder, it's his defense, why did he do it? And it's a relentless, relentless self-revelation to a wife, an extraordinary opening, which is the opposite of what that does in public. Okay, so now I put a lot of stuff on the table, and we can do it now very carefully and see how this is how this is structured. I mean, some of this, I I mean, I was blown away rereading it, and I think it's one really one of the greatest uh, German novels, certainly written in the 70s and 80s and 90s. I cannot think but of a book that's great, that's greater. Just in, a, I, in, in I accomplishment. I don't see the same uh, relationship with his wife. Uh, I no. feel that. In, in the Schwanenhaus, yeah. I feel that the relationship is, is hardly there on, on both their parts. It's very, it's very subtle. It's a, it's a, there's a, there's She's taking care of everything. There's total, strange, there's total estrangement. I completely agree with you. They're, they're, she's taking care of the children while he's completely checked out. He is not with the program. She does everything. She takes care of Latina. She cares <coughs> about Rosa. She's actually the one who sells gets, the house. Who sells the houses? She gets everything done. And all he, he's a Schlemiel character. He does nothing. He's a loafman. She's a Cornish. She's nothing. He's, but, but, he but spends see, the money. It's, it would be easy to conclude that. But huh? on the other hand, on would, the other hand, thank you. It would be easy to conclude that. But what I mean about yeah. being off balance is, on the other hand, thank you. On the other hand, he brings in uh, money. He's able to buy to spend money when he wishes. He buys the he buys the, the carpet. He buys the camera. He, but he, he can't really he, afford it. He can't really afford it. He's indeed he's in debt. Oh. Or well, maybe no, he can no, afford no, it. It's not clear that he's in debt. Actually, it, it, in fact, yeah. he has this long monologue about is he in debt or is he wealthy? And you can well understand someone who's brought up in in penury as he seems to have been. He's got certain you know parameters in which he, he wishes he would act, but at the same time, he's able to...